issues relating to housing and architecture, and a professor of architecture at the University of Minnesota. Julia received her PhD from Delft Technical University. In 2015, she was awarded the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture Distinguished Professor Award. Significant accolades for a professor with over, over 35 years of teaching, but for me, Julia will always be the first female architecture professor I ever had while studying architecture. And this is after a four-year undergraduate degree at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, a year's study at the Architecture Association in London, England, and another year's study at the International Graduate School in Stockholm, Sweden. As my role model, formative in my graduate education, Julia contributed to my architectural education in areas of social justice, human-centered well-being, and knowledge, or what we call evidence-based design methods. Of social concern, Julia's book, Institution and Home, Architecture as a Cultural Medium, in 2006, details the complex tensions between institutional and home environments when designing housing for people with special needs. We don't have that book in the library, but she has promised to send me one, and I will definitely put it in. She taught for years in the area of environmental design and the social cultural context. Relating to her work on knowledge-based design, I remember fondly a research monograph that she and another colleague created entitled Programming as Design. And I've spoken about this with my ARC 603 students. Although used widely at the University of Minnesota, the work was unavailable outside the U, but I'm pleased to say that Julie has brought us a copy, so I will continue to share that with all of us as we learn more about the richness of programming and design and the interrelationship between the two. Her newest book, however, and the subject of her lecture and the gallery exhibit that opened today is Complex Housing, Designing for Density. And this book we do have in the library, as well as another book that she was a co-author of called The Discipline of Architecture. The work, Complex Housing, analyzes a particular innovative form of housing with higher densities that do three things. One, mix diverse uses, housing types, and income levels. Two, develop key programming elements, issues, and design principles. And then, three, illustrate innovative approaches in Dutch planning and discusses the implications for our planning in the Amer American complex. Through eight comparative case studies, Julia's work shows successful approaches to design for density, which reflect values like long-term planning, a right to housing for all people, and access to light, to air, and to nature. Julia's life work has not only influenced me in the making of socially appropriate and innovative environments, but has played and continues to play a significant role in transforming the field of architecture to the knowledge-based profession and discipline that it is today. It is with great pleasure to introduce my professor, friend, and colleague, Dr. Julia Williams-Robinson. Wow, well, thank you. That was a very sweet introduction. What a lovely thing to say. <laughs> um, I better put this in my pocket before I start dropping things. Um, so, talking about Dutch complex housing, and I even get, I think I got this to work. There we go. And so just a little bit to remind, a little promotion about my book and the exhibition which you have out here. And then the third thing, we had a symposium um, at the University of Minnesota, and we're doing a little video and a monograph about it, so that's going to come out eventually, it's taking longer than we thought. Um, but the talk today is going to be in four parts, talk a little bit about the background, because um, uh, the title then is, what is it, why, how, and where? I'm not sure what the three questions were, but at any event, so looking at the background, so we're looking at, at why, was this, why did this happen in the Netherlands, um, then looking at those examples, particular examples 
um, what, what is it like and, and where is it happening, and then um, design principles and implications, so what do we do about it, and then um, I was asked to talk a little bit about some teaching that I did based on the, on the, um, the book and the, the whole idea of Dutch housing. So go through this very quickly, a little bit about the background. I don't know how many of you know about the Netherlands, but I'm going to ask you if you can respond and even throw out some ideas. When, you, when I say the Netherlands, what do you think about? What does it comes to mind? Louder. Whoever, throw out an idea. Anyone have any ideas? Water. Water, that's one good idea. Trains that run on time. God's country. The old, the adage, you, maybe you know the adage, God made the world, but the Dutch made the Netherlands. <laughs> um, anything else? Anyone could think of? Well, we'll go through some of the things that you, um, well, they went backwards. That didn't help. So we have um, windmills. Why did we have windmills? Because in the Middle Ages, that was the technology for pumping water, because the Netherlands is below sea level. They create, so when they say the Dutch created the Netherlands, it's because they expanded into the ocean by draining land or into the sea or out, out of lakes. So they created a lot of land by draining and, by draining and pumping and pumping the water up to the sea. Um, so you have canals, which also relate to the, to the windmills. And we have bicycles because the Netherlands is in a delta where it's very flat. So you can bicycle everywhere without having to climb up very many hills, especially in the west. And then, of course, tulips, because tulips grow in this beautiful agricultural country with um, all the uh, wonderful drainage and, um, uh, what do you call it, the water. <laughs> so, and the other, then the other thing about the Netherlands is that it's a very rich country, and that comes from its position in Europe. And you can see, it's, as I said, it's a delta of, but it's delta of three rivers that come together, the Scheldt, the Meuse, and the Rhine. And the reason that that's important is that in the Middle Ages, people didn't do trade on roads, they did trade by water. And so the, the, all, the, all the people who were trading along these water routes ended up in the Netherlands, and then they could ship it or have it come from in the ships from all over the world. So spices would come to this site, and then they would go up the river, or you'd have the jewelry from Poland would come down the river or whatever, so that the river then became the Netherlands became extremely wealthy because it was sort of this exchange point for the merchant in the times, um, those times. And of course, its position as a delta below sea level means that there's a lot of technology that they had to develop, so they have a very strong engineering um, orientation. And then, of course, to, as designers, we know that they, since they designed their country, they're very interested in all kinds of design, whether it's fashion or shoes or whatever. Um, it's, uh, I don't think they do cars so much, but boats. Anyway, and then of course the last piece is it's one of the most dense countries in the world. And so it has certain characteristics for housing that make it especially interesting. Okay, so we're talking about the uh, idea of creating land um, from under the sea, and so my former husband who, um, well he's, he's not my, he's my late husband, um, Richard Stoltenberg, who used to take students to the Netherlands with me from the United States, would say, since the Middle Ages we've been pumping day and night, and um, that's because they're below sea level. Oh, I should say a little bit about that slide too. In the, in the Netherlands, it's a very middle class country because it developed along the um, rivers, it developed the cities. And so they, rather than the, the people who were rich were not the nobles in this country, unlike many of the other countries in Europe, the people who were rich were the merchants. And so the, the life really of the country revolved around the cities. And in the, one of the things that the nobles did, which was interesting, was that they allowed, they said that if the serfs would create more land, they would tax them instead of um, having them serf, so they would become free farmers. So that was another thing that, that created more middle class people. So the, this country is a very much more of a middle class country than a lot of the other countries where um, the, the hierarchies, the social hierarchies were more pronounced in the past. And here is the Netherlands in two positions. One, if you pump on the left and if you don't pump on the right. So you can see that the Netherlands is in a very precarious situation um, if they don't keep pumping. So that was one of the things that leads to planning. 
And that's a central theme, well, two things. The central theme in the Netherlands is planning because you cannot do anything on land unless you plan for water first because you're going to get trouble if you don't plan properly. But the other thing is that in the, in the Middle Ages, if your neighbor didn't pump their land, you were going to be in trouble. So everybody had to cooperate and discuss any time a decision was made. So there's a big history of discussion and cooperation, which I think we could use a little bit of here. <laughs> Um, so here are these wonderful windmills, um, and a, a little about the density. So this is where the, the density comes in. You can see that the dense, very dense in the western part of the country called the Randstad, R-A-N-D-S-T-A-D, -D, um, in, in any event. And you can see on the left here, these are the sites the building's going to be talking about. They're all in this very dense part of the Netherlands. Another thing you should know about is I don't know if you've heard of a Gini score, but it represents the degree of disparity between the rich and the poor in a given country. And if we look at um, the, the higher the Gini score, the more the disparity, and we see, or the lower, wait a minute, the higher is more disparity, and the lower is less disparity, but we see that the Netherlands is 25 compared to the United States, which is 45. And um, the Netherlands is um, on the, almost the fifth from the bottom in terms of the, the least disparity between rich and poor. So, and that comes about because they tax high-income people, and most people, um, you end up having much more of a, uh, you're, you lose your wealth if, you, if you're too rich, uh, to taxation. And they also, um, another thing which I'll just mention is that they like government, unlike people in the United States, because in, after World War II, the government created a situation in the Netherlands where they have health care, where they have um, higher education is paid for, they support housing, they have, it's, it's, it's a socialist system in which everyone sees what government does for them and they appreciate what happens in their country. Although they've elected a rightist government and has stopped some of these things, so um, who knows where it's going to go next, but um, I think it's not going to go too far in the wrong direction. So the Housing Act of um, 1901, I want to make sure here I have my notes. Um, in, the, in the 19th century, there was industrialism, as we all know, and so many, as in so many places in the Netherlands, people moved from the farms to the city. And the Amsterdam, actually, um, for many years did not expand, and so they ended up with an extremely densely populated center. And then in the 19th century, they began to realize that they needed to expand, and they allowed private developers to develop the land. Um, the next sort of layer is, I don't know if you remember Amsterdam, but it's a series of concentric circles and they allowed sort of the next concentric circle to develop. And um, at that time, then the private developers actually very successfully developed both the um, housing for the middle class and housing for the rich people, but the housing that they did for the poor people was very bad, and there were lots of diseases and all kinds of things, and the people, the city in Amsterdam, the city um, became very concerned about this, and they responded by developing this housing act, and one of the big people who was involved in this was Berlage, Hendrik Petrus Berlage, who is um, a very well-known architect who did the Berlage Bourse, which you probably have seen in your history classes and a number of other wonderful projects, but for what his effect on the Netherlands was very profound because he was a very great advocate of city planning. And this Housing Act of 1901 required that cities do a city plan and also that architects then be involved in the city plan and in the design of the housing. And so this set up a pattern where in the country, um, in each city, developed city planning. And so that makes a big difference in the idea. And that taking the idea from Camila Cité, uh, the idea of the, ci the um, city as an urban fabric. So housing in this context is not a building. Housing is a piece of an urban fabric. It's a part of a neighborhood that's been designed, that you have an urban design, and then you have building design. And they are um, interlinked and um, tied together. So you don't just plunk your building down any old place, surprise, surprise, but you have to have an urban plan that you're using to design it. So um, that's something that I think we could learn a lot from. Big sure I got all this. Um, so the next thing uh, that deals with the Housing Act of 1901 
is that the government then took responsibility, and I'm not sure of the total history, but I know cer certainly in Amsterdam, there were at that time three pillars. That we, and this is a Dutch term, three pillars. There were the Catholics, the Protestants, and then there were the other people, primarily represented by the socialists, and the, a lot of the Jewish people were in that category, the diverse people. Um, and they, the government, each group wanted to serve their low-income people, and so the government decided, well, we'll give each group money to build housing projects in Amsterdam. So there's a series of housing projects, especially in the southwest of Amsterdam, Zout, anyway, of the city, or a number of these projects are. And the idea was that the housing corporations, which are like our nonprofit organizations, um, were charged with building communities. And so they built at that time, this is in the early 20th century, they built neighborhoods which had housing, but also had commercial areas, had libraries, schools, um, they had laundry facilities. They, the housing at that time did not have um, bathing facilities in the housing, they had public baths and so on. But they built then these communities, and these housing projects still exist, they've been renovated over the years and they're still very beautiful, and they're designed to be neighborhoods that have a coherent identity. So this was something that Berlaga was very importantly um, part of, and um, that was contributed, uh, has contributed to the time, over time. And so this was dealing with the idea of emancipating the workers and creating a way of creating a middle class out of the, what had been really a lower class, that they wanted to have a middle class country. So this was something that they invested in um, from the government. So I'm talking about a period much later, of course. This is between 1990 and 2000, and this was a period of transformation in the Netherlands. But at the time, at the beginning of this period, we had um, three layers of government working on planning. So you had the national government, which was um, looking at the housing needs. So they did research on housing. They identified how many housing units were needed, which type of housing units were needed, where they were needed. And then they would, ident they would give money to these different areas of, this, of the country to develop the housing. At that time, there was a regional plan. And the regional areas were responsible for developing things like um, green space and um, uh, transportation. So as um, you were saying, bicycle transportation, pedestrian transportation, um, buses, buses, trains, all these different kinds of systems were coordinated through this, the regional development. And then at the local area, you were, as you remember from the Housing Act of 1901, they were required to make an urban plan. And then um, they, um, after they made the plan, then they, the urban areas would choose a developer to work with them. I, I think I'm, I'm thinking this a competitive process. And then um, the developer chooses architects. And then, interestingly enough, the architects and the developers work together, and they renegotiate with the city how the plan should go, because of course a plan is never, uh, is never the, quite implemented the way it was originally planned. So there's always this negotiation between the parties. And, and in the Netherlands, of course, discussion and cooperation. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to mention here is that the thing, situation was not the same today as it was in 1990 when they started this. And so we can see here that if we go from 1947, and this is a really bad slide, isn't it, but up to 2010, that um, the Housing Act created rental housing. And so at the beginning of the 20th century, I think it was 70% of the housing was rental housing by, that was contributed by the government. And then there was a quite a sizable mark. Well, maybe not here. We have, let's see, the owner of oh, the social housing is small, actually surprisingly small in 1947. Social housing actually increases. And the, the rental housing, however, was quite large, so there was a predominantly rental housing in, um, in, the, in the Netherlands, and then you can see that the home ownership is increasing. So that was something that the government decided was really important to, to, to have, was to increase the home ownership. So, and in the 1980s, I guess it's 1995, um, there was a recession, and the housing corporations built very good housing. And they still owned a lot of this housing. So they were actually very rich. And the, and the government said, well, we don't have very much money to subsidize housing. We should really let the um, housing market be carried by the housing corporations, at least in the low-income area. So 
they allowed then the housing corporations to sell some of their housing, and it wasn't just to low-income people, but generally to afford an affordable way. And so then they had capital, and the government got out of the business of subsidizing housing, um, and of at least subsidizing new housing. And so the um, housing corporations now are in a market system which is somewhat different. It's somewhat controlled still, but it's still um, it, it's much more much more of a market-oriented system than it was previously. And so their own ownership has increased greatly. Uh, the social housing is still quite sizable, but the private rental has very much decreased. So I think that's all the notes I had to follow. <laughs> Didn't want to miss that. Um, and then here, just to show that the the recession of 2008 made a big impact, so people can ask me, What's, what are they doing now? And for they haven't been building very much housing at all, because during the recession, there was a terrible um, crisis in Europe, and no money was made available to design, how, build housing. And of course, because of the rightist government, and they didn't do planning, and they didn't fund, they weren't subsidizing anything. So um, a lot of architects went out of business, and, um, and the, but the municipalities continued to do housing, so housing planning, so there, well, there was no, designing at the federal level, the municipalities continue to do that. So now we're going to talk about this housing that I fell in love with. And um, here are the examples. You can see them out there in the courtyard, in the um, exhibit space. Just to mention that this project was not done by me alone. I had many, many um, architecture students, undergraduate and graduate research assistants working with me, and they contributed the diagrams. We worked together to make all the diagrams, all the um, the photographs I did myself, but all the plans and all the drawings that are other than the photographs were done by students together with me um, to show these ideas. So what is a complex housing? So this is a term that I've developed because in looking at particular housing that was totally fascinating and trying to understand what it was, what were the things that I was seeing that were so interesting? So first of all, these projects are large. Most of them are a city block, or at least half a city block. Um, they have units for rental and purchase. They have, um, let's see, a mix of different income levels in them. So usually they have all three from um, what was once, they were designed often for social housing, and then middle income as well as upper income, so it's mixed, mixed um, income. Also, they have different types of housing. So you'll see row housing in the bottom. You'll see flats, maisonettes. You have um, also different organizational strategies. Some of them are single-loaded corridors. You have skip-stop units. You have uh, row houses accessed from the ground, row houses accessed from the courtyard that's above ground, all these different types of access. And they're, high, they're, they're, very, they're not, they're not um, high-rise. So the Netherlands has not traditionally done high-rise buildings. Uh, they're very expensive to do, and um, they, are, they don't want to spend the money because of the soil in many of the places is very difficult. So they build mid-rise, which they, uh, and actually many of the housing units, the projects that we see the, we're tending to be um, a maximum of eight stories. Sometimes there's a tower, one of the towers I think is 20 stories, but usually the, ma the buildings for the most part are four, four to six stories. And um, of course includes also non-housing uses, so some of the housing projects have things like clinics and child care centers, and I'll talk about that later. And then um, because of the scale and because of the architecture, they're urban landmarks. So I think there are projects that are complex housing that aren't urban landmarks, but of course, those weren't the ones I fell in love with. And so I'm going to talk about the ones that I, th that I think are especially interesting. The way I analyze these was through the idea of typology. So I'm looking at massing. How are they massed? These are some of the typological elements, not all. Um, the different types of housing, so here I talk about what is a house. A house is a unit that you access from ground level. Um, maisonette is a two-story unit that's usually not on ground level, and back-to-back um, -back, um, maisonettes, so there are different ways of arranging them, the, these maisonettes. Back-to-back, -back, crossover, live-work housing, a number of the projects have live-work housing. Skip-stop maisonettes, a number of them have that, penthouses, and then there are also, which should be here, they're group homes. A number of the projects have group homes or housing for the elderly in the project. So these projects don't just serve one population, they're serving mixed, mixed, mixing people of different backgrounds. And then these different types of access, 
ground level, gallery access, which is also called single loaded carter, double loaded carter, which is what we usually do, um, skips up level loaded carter, or vestibule, which is the kind you just go out into a little hall and have your units. So these are the different typologies of access. And then outdoor spaces, we have gardens, and sometimes they're roof, uh, the bottom one is a rooftop garden, balconies, and then lodges. And this is, this is a, a term that I came to understand by seeing housing in the Netherlands. The Netherlands, when they build housing in a windy place or in a um, place where there's a lot of noise, like a, near a railroad track, they often create lodges, which is instead of having a balcony that sticks out of the building, you have a build up an ex exterior space that is within the envelope of the building. So we actually, um, do, we don't do that as much here as we should, I think. It's a very interesting thing. And one of the things about outdoor spaces is that um, people in the Netherlands are very accepting of dense housing. And after having observed how they do it, I think that one of the reasons that people in the Netherlands accept it is because, well, first of all, it's very dense. So it's expensive to have a house that has a garden. But if you have a very nice balcony, it's just as good as a house on the ground. It doesn't matter if you can sit outside and have your breakfast in, in the sun on your balcony. Um, it's, it's perfectly fine. So it's, I think that if we built housing with better outdoor space, it would be more accepted by people to have dense housing. That's my theory. <laughs> it isn't proven. <laughs> eight examples. So here are the eight examples, and they're uh, talking about them predominantly. And as you look at this, think about several things. Think about how it's sited on the block. So how is it set back? How are, what kind of courtyards are there? That kind of thing. How tall is it? What is the variety of units? What is the density? What is the, um, do I have access and unit types? The use of courtyards? And what are the non-housing functions? So those are some of the things that you may want to consider. So the first project, how are we doing for time? Ooh, that took longer than I should have. So I'll try to rush through this a little bit. Um, so this is De Musen. This was the um, first project that just, I, I was so surprised at this project. This project is, if you look at this uh, site plan, site photograph, aerial photograph, um, you can see that it's about a quarter mile long. And it has two, uh, I have a pointer here, yes. I don't know if it works. Oh, I was pointing the wrong way. That's why I'm confused here, okay. So uh, here, there's a um, point, oh here, where the bicycle, the pedestrian and bicycles go, can go around this whole park. And so this is uh, facing this park. And this project was a, actually designed as a competition. And the original design was this, was to fit in this, what now is the parking area. And the, co this, the competition was won by Atelier Pro. And they decided that it was too close to the housing units. That this was just, this is that, to have that many units that close would create a shadow. So they, for their design, made a long, thin project, this very long, thin project, and they've won the competition by totally disobeying the rules, which is often how you win. <laughs> so, um, but the, so the design, what's interesting about the design, and you'll see that in the diagram, but I'll do it on, on here, is that the, when they talked to the people there, the, people, the older people who were mostly, mostly older people in this neighborhood, said, we don't think that bedrooms should be on the ground floor. So when you design this, make sure that the bedrooms are on the, above the first floor. Well, how could you do that? You had to do a row house that was going to be two stories tall. So the entire, um, oopsie, oopsie, I went backwards. Um, the entire ground floor is row houses. Even, in, and then there's the next level is flat. So there's three stories here and three stories here. And then they have flats in the middle section up to five stories. And on the very top are penthouses. And then to top it all off, they built little, um, what they call tulip, um, buildings, which have um, flats and maisonettes, and they connected it with an interior courtyard. And this was designed as housing for the elderly, and so it was very handy to have an interior space that in the wintertime that you could go out and have experience um, plants and so on. So um, they fought, and this is also in the competition, and this I think was also part of why they won. It was such a good idea, and they ha they was very difficult because the city didn't want to do it, and it was expensive, and finally they figured out a way to do it, and they made it work. Um, so let's see, what's I going to say? Something else probably, but we'll just go on. Oh, I went backwards again. I've got to get used to this. Okay, so Almira, this is in the city of Almira. Almira is a polder city, 
which is a city built on some of that land that was brought out, this is in the South Sea of um, Amsterdam, the South Sea of um, the Netherlands. Um, the polder, the polder, they made very, very large tracts of land on this polder. Actually, there are two cities, but the one city is Almere, which is really basically a suburb, suburb of, of Amsterdam connected by train. And so, we, and so it's a suburban development, unlike some of these other projects. And so it's not very dense because it's all, the, the, the way you count density includes all the parking. And it, but if you took the parking and put it under the building, it would be much more dense. Um, so there was community participation, as you heard, in the site planning designed for elderly. But when they went to sell it, what happened was that there was a glut of housing for the elderly. So they ended up having to sell it to people of all ages, although it was people without children. Um, and it ended up being sold because of there was, they built it during the period when there was, it was planned to be social housing and then they started selling off units. So it ended up being, and also because it was expensive, they had to sell it um, to board to build it. Um, let's see, it originally included social housing, long building frames, this park, this interior park yard, parking adjacent parking on grade. So let's go to the next. So here is the design. You can see then these different types of housing layered up. And then on the section, you see the same thing. So the row housing, the flats with a single loaded corridor here, flats. Um, this, some of these are maisonettes. And then this, the uh, setback uh, 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 penthouses at the top. And then here's the interior courtyard. And say space syntax, one of the ways I was analyzing and I didn't mention was using space syntax analysis. And so just to give you a little idea how this works, um, this lowest dot is the outside of the building. And then the next dots are the, all the spaces that are connected to the outside. And in this case, we have one social space. So that's the space that isn't housing. And then all these other spaces are row houses. And then you go into the courtyard. And in the courtyard, then, you take an elevator up here or elevator up here, or you enter these row houses. And um, then you go up the elevator on this side. And there are some the houses outside. You remember on these are the houses outside. And then these are all connected along this interior um, walkway that connects the both of the elevator to each other. So now I'll talk about Celodam. Maybe some of you may have seen about Celodam. This is a pretty highly publicized project by MVRDV and built in 2006. And you can see that it's expressed as a kind of a container ship idea. And what was fun about what the MVRD did was that they realized that this, this was built, actually built in the river and that everywhere you looked from this building, you had a fabulous view. So no matter what they did, they were going to sell the units. And so they decided to really do an experiment where they built all these different typologies. And I think in the end, the building, I think they designed 30, but I think they actually built 17. Of course, the developer had some say in reducing the number. <laughs> but each of these different, whoopsie, I went the wrong way, back. Each of these different colors and materials represents a different building typology. So if you ever wanted to study building typologies, take this building out and you can look at all the different housing possibilities or many of the different housing possibilities that could be designed. Um, so let's see, I'm not going to spend too much time. There's, so the parking is under adjacent dock and it's automated parking built in the water. It includes a co-op project that had been built on the site, had um, some older housing that was squatted by, for a number of years and they the city didn't want the squatters to be there anymore, so they offered them the opportunity to have a place in this building. And some of them declined, and others participated. And there is a co-op housing in the building as a one, one of the housing typologies. And uh, let's see, upper, middle, and lower income, sale and rent, four, four blocks. We'll look at the diagram next. Um, so you'll see here there are three elevators and then four blocks on either side of the elevators. And then the corridors reflect these different housing types, because some of them are two stories and some of them are one story. So you have housing that goes in and out. You have one type of housing, which is double loaded corridor all the way down. But the, all the other ones have these mixture of different types of um, corridors that connect. And then the parking is under this wharf. And if you hear some of the different types of access on the top are single loaded and then lower area are double loaded, and then there's a staircase thrown in for fun. 
And then um, one of the things I forgot to say, the city said that they, in, when they built this project that one of the rules was that you had to have a public space that would be accessible to the public on the river. So they built the, um, this deck on the back, um, that diagram, if we go back a little bit, that's um, here, you can see, so you can walk if you go to Amsterdam and want to go on this, see this building, you can go underneath and onto the other side. It's open to the public, you can just walk onto that, that deck. So, and then this is the upper right there is the automated parking. So you, you bring your car in, you push a button, and your car goes down and it's parked for you. Uh, I don't know what you do if it's broken, but um, I hope it never breaks. <laughs> and this is the, the space syntax diagram. So you can see then these, basically the three elevator cores, but there's not a single pattern. So it's very diverse in terms of the way the different things circulate. Um, basically these little, uh, groups are groups of housing of a similar type that are off a sim similar corridors. You have these little communities within the building, and then what they also designed was to have all the all these are connected. So once you're in the building, you can go anywhere in the building, and there are a lot of different places. They have um, some spaces that they turned into uh, toy libraries and exercise spaces and so on, interspace that everyone has access to. So it creates a very community-oriented building. Um, how are we doing here? <clears throat> Garnisa Land is a project built outside of Rotterdam in an area called Barendrecht. And Barendrecht is, um, has a, a small traditional little town. And when Rotterdam said, well, we're, we're the, we, well, actually, I suppose it was the federal government said, Barendrecht, I'm very sorry to say that we're expanding Rotterdam into, the, into your district. And they said, okay, but you can't destroy our traditional city town. You have to have a different center for the town. So, um, they, and then of course, in the Netherlands, you, a mayor is appointed by the queen. So the mayor, and it, well, the town didn't exist yet, but there was a mayor, and the mayor said, well, I want a town uh, that has a church tower because in the Netherlands, where it's very flat, every town gets its identity from its church tower, but there were no churches interested in building a tower. So the mayor said, okay, well then we'll build a housing tower that will be the sign of the city. So this, build, this um, housing project here is on the city town square. Behind us is the shopping center, and then this is a housing project, and to the left is another housing project, and then this is Carnisaland. And so this project then has a housing tower which has um, two different, um, um, this has on the upper floor are the um, single penthouse, so the whole floor is devoted to a penthouse, and on the lower levels it's divided into two for middle class housing, but the tower then functions as this separate, almost separate identity. There's actually two different owners organizations in this building, and that's one of the things I didn't for, did forget to mention, was when the, when the housing corporations sold units, the government had to create a way to have maintenance on a building that was owned by two different owners. And so they developed owners organizations where you have um, the housing corporation has a, usually a majority interest in the unit and the owners also have a voice in the maintenance. And so they have an owners meeting a couple times a year where they talk about how to do this and how to, what the problems are. So they have the mayor with a church, no churches, et cetera. And the project itself is designed so that it has a, um, this, it, there's a walkway from this central plaza underneath the building to housing beyond, so it's connected to the whole area. Um, and then there is a library and a clinic in, next to that walkway connects to the library and the clinic. You'll see that in some of the pictures here later. And it has these different, these different um, income levels, although this project is a little more conservative in the sense that Usually within this project, except for the tower, which has upper and middle income, most of the, pro most of the areas have all one income. Although I guess it's not really true because the, um, they designed it for social housing and um, they ended up selling it as a lot of the housing that had been designed for social housing was turned into middle class housing. And so the, the way it's designed then, it has a lot of this, this particular part has row housing on the bottom and then si single loaded corridor or gallery design above. Um, for the most part, that's how this project is designed. 
Let's see, did I talk about, wait a minute, let me make a couple of points. Parking, and parking is both underneath and on site, and they're basically four housing types. Um, and this is how it's laid out with two, so that the, let's see, here's, this is the plaza, there are two courtyards, and then this is the walkway that goes back. Um, here you can see, look in the other direction, here's the walkway underneath, this is the clinic, this is the library. These are row houses, this is live work, this is a group home, um, these are low income housing, on the top, the bottom layer is row houses and then flats above. So that sort of gives you a flavor of the um, project. And here is an, inter this is the only, I think, interior I'm showing, but it gives you a sense of it. These are, this is a very typical Dutch design with, um, you come into a corridor, two bedrooms here. Um, this is the dining room, the kitchen and living room, and so you come through, enter to the, this area. I think there may be a door here too. And so you can see here that on the right, this is the kitchen in this middle with the dining and the living beyond. And then in this, this project was built um, in a period where they, they did not require sufficient outdoor space. And so the people in this dwelling didn't have a balcony and they have to um, have their outdoor space in the corridor. And so this corridor is actually quite active with different chairs and so on. But they were, very, they were not happy about this and they changed the rule afterwards. So it was about a two year period where this rule was suspended and of course this project was built during that period. Okay, um, so this is the design. You can see it's a little more conservative design with quite distinct um, building types linking in each of the projects. A lot of row houses and some commercial spaces and of course the clinic and the um, library. This project is perhaps the most radical in one sense, in the sense that this is a cooperative housing project. And it was developed by um, the, the people who were the cooperative. So the cooperative decided to get together and they, one of the people in there was a, a very well-known architect who had done a lot of um, previously cooperative project, Hein de Haan, he's recently died. And um, it was designed then for to be a multi-income housing that people wanted diverse people. And one of the things that was interesting about the group was one of the uh, members of the original group had a child who was a, had a, was a schizophrenic child and they couldn't find housing as they became an adult. And so they wanted to build a group home for this child. So the, there's a group home in the project. There's a lot of other interesting functions. Um, so it's built as a green project, built as a participatory project. They worked with um, a housing corporation to help them develop some of the non-housing functions, because if you remember, originally the housing corporations were charged to do more than just housing, and so they can still are be asked to do this. Um, and then they advertised for co-op participants, and that during the period of design, they met regularly and worked with the architect to cite the project. Um, so some of the different housing types, group home, maisonette, water facing flat, live work unit, and atelier. And a lot of the people in the group were artists and they wanted to have a live work environment. So the ground floor is, is designed to be uh, work units. And that was one of the interesting things, one of the things about financing that they discovered was that it was, you could finance workplaces for less than um, you could finance housing for. So by designating a large part of the project as workspaces, they got better financing arrangements. Who knows? <laughs> Um, so we have to figure out all the angles, right? The other thing about that is that there is, there are banks that are specifically, um, that will finance cooperative housing. In our country, it's very difficult to get that finance, but the, they set up situations and the land that this is on was in an area that along the river that was developed um, where, um, it's, um, what is the name of it? Iberg. Um, where they cre created uh, enlarged existing islands to create more housing along the river because they had already developed most of the housing that was freed up from the shipping changes. And so they set aside particular lands in several of these areas for cooperative housing. So this, they, they applied and got the project. And so this is the design. You can see it has a courtyard in the middle. The, this is the water facing flats. So they're long and thin, but they all have a, a, a water views. There's actually water views along this side. And then um, there's a child care center here. On the lower level, there's a cafe, and above that is a theater. Here is the group home. 
And then there are other kinds of spaces because Kindahan was just a wild guy. There's a, there's a, next door is a sailing school they built, and there's a fl float where they can have boats, and then they have a float for swimming. Totally against the rules, and somehow Hindahan managed to get it done in this, because <laughs> he was so clever. Anyway, um, so this is the project here. So these are the, where these different, these different functions. On the top we have the theater, and then there's also a, um, a, a greenhouse, where this is where the teenagers get together, and this cafe. So the workshop, sailing school, greenhouse, you can see lots of different things going on. And this is the most complex design, perhaps, although there's a rival. But you can see that one of the things is that it's very interconnected. So this is the courtyard. So everything comes through the courtyard. It's kind of the hub of activity. And that was intentional, so everyone would get to know everybody. You have to go through the courtyard. And then this is the street. And so the building, um, the workspaces are accessed directly from the streets. But the housing is all accessed from the courtyard, different types of housing. And then these are different. different I won't go into it. You have to read the book. <laughs> OK, Zilver Flood. Um, I know I didn't want to fall off the stage here. Uh, Zilver Flood is another totally fascinating project. This project um, comes out because there was a, um, this is in the city of Dordrecht, which is um, near Rotterdam, not so far. And it's, um, again, a city on the water, as many of these cities are. But this particular project um, was built in the, well, the original the original situation in the city was a 25-acre site that was built in the 60s as exclusively low-income housing. So by the 80s, the project was in trouble, because we all know today that you don't do that. But of course, they had to live and learn. So in the 80s then, the housing corporation that was responsible for this was losing oodles of money because people were not paying rent and they were moving out of the buildings. and so. They hired um, a participatory architect, after comp competition, of course, a uh, particular architect that people my generation know, Lucien Kroll, who was very, very well known for his participatory approach. And so he came and worked with the town for the, the, the inhabitants for, I, I don't remember exactly how long, I think it's six to eight years. And then they came up with a design, and they, they recognized that they needed to have mixed incomes. They needed to add schools and um, sports facilities and commercial things to this neighborhood to make it into a real neighborhood so that it wasn't so um, separated from the city and, and not non-functioning. <coughs> so this, <coughs> excuse me, what we see here is a project that is the commercial center. And they, they, there was, had been a very large open area that was too large to be functional. And they divided it in two and said, this is, and it's, it was happened to be on a very active street. So this is where we'll put our commercial center. So this is the, the design for the commercial center with housing above. So the lowest level is parking. The middle level of the ground level is all commercial and then housing above. And so here you see there are of two courtyards. There's a commercial courtyard. I don't have any of you know the Netherlands, but Albert Hein is the store that's here. And then there's another um, the grocery store here. And then there's, some, I don't remember, this is a restaurant and all different kinds of commercial spaces. And they worked, they, um, the city worked with the developer. And the, they were very active in certain kinds of things as they wanted to keep the shopping center. So they worked with a Turkish community to develop to make sure that the, the food that they would sell would be of interest to the people living in the area and so on. They were very careful about how they went about actually solving the problem. So it's quite interesting. So let's see. So it's a renovation, low income housing area, community participation. So I think I've talked about that. We don't have to do that. Some of the different housing types. So there's houses. If we go back a second, I'm going to go back backwards. Um, the housing, there's three houses actually uh, 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 that open onto the, uh, the courtyard, which is over the, 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 the stores. And then the, the, they, um, let's go, well, I won't go into this in detail. But um, so there's maisonettes in these, in, the, um, in these projects here. Some of them are single loaded carters, and some of them are flats. And the single loaded, there's live work in a certain area. There's skip stop maisonettes in this area that create this bridge over the that entry bridge, and then there are penthouses on the top. And you can see these penthouses with gardens on the top. 
And so those are often the sites where the uh, um, upper income people are living, and below them may be low income people. So there really is that this project mixes all different types of, of um, incomes. And um, of course, Lucien Kroll is quite the leftist, and he believed that every unit should be different. And so I don't know how it's, he made it in this affordable building with all these units different. Do not ask me how he did it. You have to ask him if he'll talk to you. Okay. So he designed it as eight buildings, including this tower. And um, then this is the courtyard, up the upstairs courtyard. And then this is, these are, this, these are mixed income. These are middle and upper income, so that they're mixed all different kinds of ways. But actually, when you look at the space syntax diagram, which I believe is next, yes, you actually see there are five, five of these um, elevator cores. So there are eight buildings in theory, but they're really only five elevator cores. But there, again, if you look at the diagram, you can see that they're organized somewhat differently and that they're also interconnected so that everybody can get to that garden space that's over the supermarket. La Grande Cour, this project is right next to the train station in Amsterdam. Some, has anyone been to Amsterdam and seen this project from the train? So you may have recognized this one. This, um, actually, the, what makes this project interesting to me are these um, cantilevered spaces, and they were not in part of the original design. So that's um, kind of interesting. Um, the original design, if we, if we go to the next slide, was actually more like this. But it turned out that when the um, city gave the, assigned to the developer this envelope and it says you had to get so many units into it, when they gave it to the architect, the architect said, well, we can't possibly get all those units in there. They were one third short. And so they went to the city and they said, well, what do we do now? And the city said, we don't care what you do except you can't just add on another couple of stories because that's going to create shading in the streets and shading in the courtyards. So what were they going to do? So they developed this idea of um, a periscope building, which has a lot of units on the horizontal elements and then a few units going up. Two of these have just one unit on each floor. This one has two units. And, um, and they have, they're three different um, designs. The um, architect of, of the first architect who planned this out, Meyer van Scholten, saw the building and said, well, we have three courtyards. We think it's too much project for one architect. So they divided it into three, and they invited two other colleagues to come and work with them on the project. So we have these three courtyards. Um, and so you can see then the way it's designed is there's, this is um, a lot of skip stop elevator units along the, f the facade on the main street. Um, these are row houses that create these courtyards. The end of the row houses are vestibule apartments in a little tower that are and across the, between them are some um, single, single gallery access views. And then these are gallery access apartments that are for low income. And then these have different things, but mostly they're um, middle income apartments going up, and then along here are upper and middle apartments. And this particular one has a lot of very beautiful giant penthouses. If you look in the book, there's some pictures. Um, so here are the three courtyards, very different, three different architects. Um, this one is, let's see, this is Heron 5, this is um, Architect and C, and this is Meyer van Scholten. Here again, we can see the um, row houses. This is the, pen this is the periscope building, one of the periscope buildings, and this is, a, um, this is a big opening between this building and the next building. And it's, oh, I'll, I won't go into the site. You'll have to read the book for that. OK, so then this is the syntax diagram. And you can see here, this is probably, I said that the Freiburg was perhaps the most complex building. But in some sense, this may be because it's got so many more units. This has 250 units, and Freiburg only has something like 70. So um, you can see here, there are nine different elevator shafts, three on each courtyard. And then you have then these connections across the building. Now, one of the problems that they ran into was that there was a crime problem. And so in the recent, um, past, they actually have made these elevator cores more, less connected, which is too bad. Um, this is De Beclan. This project is I interesting because it was built in, an, it's built in The Hague. I don't know how many of you have been to the beautiful city. Um, 
that this, um, this area was an area with very high crime and there were several murders and people were very worried about it. And the neighbors said, well, we, we really think we have to do something. And the city decided that what they would do was to, and it also was built in a very, a land with very poor um, soils. And so the buildings weren't, being, weren't very stable. And so they decided to tear out some of these buildings along this one street where all the problems had been and to rebuild. And the neighbors decided that they really wanted to actually um, have the buildings look like the 19th century buildings. So they used the, the uh, firm, that the neighbors insisted that they not use the firm that was originally supposed to design the project with the developer, but that the developer get the, the firm that would build the more traditional buildings. So they did. And the project itself is interesting in that it has, um, they, it's designed to have row houses going along the, the back streets where they had to tear out the housing and then there's flats, the, the lowest level is commercial all along here with flats on the next levels. There's penthouses in this building. And then this is a co-op housing for the elderly right in the middle. Um, they, they covered the street with a, making a gallery. So um, and just to show you some, the existing housing on the bottom and then the top is the design. One of the problems they ran into, they originally, originally um, they had a design to have housing below grade, the parking below grade, but there was a rec the recession came along and they couldn't afford to do it uh, because it was because of the poor soils, it was very expensive. So they ended up parking on grade. So they have parking courtyards, which is a little different function from a lot of times when you have courtyards. But I think they successfully created then these decks over the courtyard for outdoor space. And then they, these the, uh, gallery access units have gardens um, along the gallery. This is the, one of the interior of the, one of the row houses. And space syntax, so this as it, because it's a traditional building, it's a more traditional um, syntax diagram with the row houses and the commercial, and then four different elevator access buildings. So the upgang, where are we coming for time? Mm -hmm. um, this is the last project. Um, this project is interesting because in Amsterdam, there was an alderman in an area that was mostly Turkish that was, um, that had a lot of mo uh, mo mosques and a very, very few churches. And this church was doing a lot of really interesting social service to the neighborhood. And the alderman said, well, the, the church building was very old and there were, had held 300 and there were only 75 or 100 people left in the congregation and they couldn't really afford to maintain it. And so he realized that they needed to do something and they did have a site that was larger than the church. So he talked to his developer friend and they um, approached the church and said, we think you can build housing on this site. Would you be interested in building housing so you could afford to have, and you could sell the housing and then you'd have capital so you can afford to have your ministry and so on and so forth. And they thought it was an interesting idea and they had a, a process in which they chose the architects and surprisingly they chose a very contemporary designer. And then when the designer worked with them and they ended up deciding to tear down the existing church and build a new one in this building. So this building has a church underneath housing and then with a childcare center at the back. And so it was, it's quite a, an interesting project in the combination of, of functions. So here's the courtyard, the childcare center. There's a row housing below here on this end with these flats above. And then this is the church below. And so here it is, it essentially um, has the, similar to the Musen, it has two elevator cores with, um, with a gallery access around, although the gallery access, because the building slopes down, there's not, it's not uniformly gallery in some places that there's access in some place there's not. Let's see, anything I need to go through here? I think that's, oh, and the garage is half level down below grade so that they have natural light and air, which saved them a lot of money. Okay, um, two types of row houses, eight types of flats based on orientation. Here's the church, the, the um, sanctuary, and then the social area where they have all the social services. And then here's the diagram. Again, these two, like um, the Musen, these two elevator cores with the uh, galleries, in some cases only accessible to one elevator core, in other cases accessible to two. 
So what are the conclusions? Um, in the book, I go through and I develop a whole lot of design principles. I'm not going to do that here because we don't have that much time, but to just talk about what the topics of some of the design principles are. So we have housing as urban fabric, so you can see all the different types of ways that housing fits into the urban fabric. We have uh, um, the, the fact that there are a lot of additional functions, and I'm including here bicycle parking, as well as these different types of courtyards and commercial and um, clinics and all these kinds of different things that were shown. The variety of courtyards, play spaces, you know, what I call a visual courtyard, where you basically have something to look at out your window. Um, this commercial courtyard, parking courtyard, and the uh, garden, interior garden, winter garden courtyard. Variety of articulation, this is a very interesting topic, how they, the Dutch are very clever at making shadows and light and all kinds of things, it's totally fascinating. Um, you'll see those when you just look at the photographs and the exhibition. Variety of dwelling types, so here we have the skip stop units creating this bridge, we have the row houses below with all these different types of flats above, this is live work, there's group homes, all kinds of things going on in these projects as I mentioned earlier. And then mix of incomes, I won't go into detail, but to say there are a lot of different ways you can mix incomes and that's something to think about how you do that. So you can um, look at this, the South exhibit, you can look at it in detail and understand it. Variety of access types, we talked about that. One of the things I didn't really talk a lot about is these decks at Freiburg are very beautiful and wonderful um, access. Um, so, um, variety of outdoor space. I talked about the loggia. These are very nice loggias. You can see a good picture of them. A nice um, penthouse design with, with a greenhouse. So, and then looking at these different plans, this is, they're all the same scale, so you can see the difference um, in scale of some of the projects. Here are the syntax diagrams, I'll briefly summarize. There are then these two projects which have the, the um, two elevator cores th that are designed with a lot of gallery access. We have um, projects which are kind of independent with these uh, independent elevator shafts, and then we have the projects which are very interconnected. Implications for design, the special circumstances that led to these design between 1990 and 2010, they, we, just, we think they don't have to be actually replicated, but there are some things that are necessary if you're going to build something like this. And so one of the big things is seeing the, the urban fabric as a housing as a piece of this urban fabric rather than seeing it as buildings. So there has to be design, there has to be urban design that's going along with this. So the site is a part of the larger neighborhoods, and that means that we need to have urban designers. We can't just go ahead and build housing without the urban design. Um, it's more likely to work when this, we have a site with an open space or some kind of a um, large street that it's on. We, usually they have, mostly they have courtyards in the middle. Um, buildings codes from the 1901 building codes is high, has a higher standard for light and air, or lick them looked, as they say in Dutch. Um, than we have here, so the, the, that's one of the reasons that you have a lot of single loaded corridor buildings is because with a single loaded corridor you can have light on both ends of the buildings, where if there are double loaded corridors we get a lot of units with just light from one side and that wouldn't work, wouldn't, wouldn't work in the Netherlands. Um, outdoor space for all dwellings, building on or close to the lot line so you don't have a lot of setbacks in the Netherlands which allows you to utilize more of the site. Also because the single loaded corridors are narrower buildings so you can actually get a courtyard on a block if you have narrow building width. Um, when laws and regulations encourage mixed income so that this didn't happen because people voluntarily mixed income, it happened because the government said you're going to build housing with mixed income. So we just need to, the government, the city said this, you're going to do it this way or you're not going to build and so they did. So mixed incomes, mixed sales and rental, financing cooperative housing, it was really important if you're going to have cooperative housing. It's more likely to be accepted when we have the citizens involved in its planning. The number of residents that share an entry courtyard is limited, small enough for people to recognize each other, and that's it, I guess. So then just a little bit about this teaching. So I'm just running five minutes over, I'm sorry. Uh, um, just, so what, we, what I decided to do, because I was teaching this seven-week workshop for non-architecture students, although many of them are going to go on and study architecture. They're in a kind of a liberal arts program where they have workshops instead of design studios. And so you can see here 
that I gave the students different types of housing. I um, can't remember, this, these are the um, single loaded corridor design. This is a vestibule, the black ones are vestibule apartments, and then these are skip stop, and um, these are row houses. So you can get a sense that each color represents a different type of housing. And so then I asked them to, so the first thing we actually did was to then look at, looked at the site. We had a particular site that was a block, city block that they were to design, and it, um, there, was a, there was already some, or it was a new area of the city, but there had been some design before of that neighborhood. And we, so we had a context uh, model they could work with. First, we looked at precedence and looked at scale. Here's Silo Dom and here is VO 57 West. This is Park Rand, which I don't know if any of you know, I should have an image of it, but the size compared to La Grande Cour, which is a giant project, you can see it. I think, no, they get on, I'm not sure they're at the same scale. They're supposed to be, but they, you know. then that's for so syntax diagrams are quite different. What happened here is they had a, you can see the top level actually has everything connected. Here's the top level, whereas all on the low, low, first level, but in between they had these kind of towers, kind of interesting design. Um, and so here are them, I had them design these different block designs. And they each, each, they worked in teams of two, and then each team had to do four or five designs. You know, they started out individually doing it, and then they worked as teams. So they ended up doing about five or six designs for the site, and then they chose one to develop. And um, they had to explain these designs, what was significant about them. So we did a lot of diagramming and sketching, and then they, Ne we nev I didn't have them do anything other than a site plan because I, it was really mostly seven weeks of model exercise, but then they drew these up in three dimensions. Um, and so you can see here's a section. Um, a section, here's the model in the context, and then the, some of the sketches that the students did. So I think that is it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Now, we have a um, gallery exhibit out over there, and so we are going to convene there in a minute to look at it, but I would like to give an opportunity for anyone who has questions that they'd like to ask right now in the group. Anyone? In a, yeah, Josh. I need the microphone. I don't know. How, uh, is the country growing by 80? People, people a year. Is the country still growing? Um, the country is not growing that, not continually to grow to the extent it was, I'll say, 10 years ago. But there still are, is, a pop, is a need for new housing because of divorces. And the, you know, the population now um, has more housing units per person than it used to have. So there still is a need for new housing. But it's not, it, it used to be a terrible housing shortage, and there's not a terrible housing shortage at this point. So that's, that's why there's probably not as much housing done, too. That's a good question. Where were these 100,000 people? I mean, they were, you were just saying... A lot of immigrants people. from Turkey and from uh, Morocco and from Suriname, some of the former colonies. Yes? When, when I was last there, there was a poster campaign and a, kind of a campaign against XL. No XL was the logo in the poster. And it, was, it was specifically targeting the apartment towers that were starting to uh, inhabit the, the eastern docklands and of Amsterdam and the like. There still is a Dutch tendency to not like apartments. Do you see now a tendency to start to embrace the flat or the apartment as opposed well, to? Well, I think I think it's, I think people feel differently about a six-story building than about a twenty-story building. So I think there still is that feeling. But I think if it's a well-designed unit, I don't think you're going to have any trouble. <laughs> settling it. Any other questions? Great. Well, I'll see you all in the exhibition space. Oh, one more. Is there another question? No. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Perfect. Beautiful.